Our text today is in Luke. And um, Luke is an interesting book. Because it's written to a specific person. If you wanted to look to, at chap, Luke chapter 1. Luke writes this and he says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative, a story of the things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect or complete understanding of all things from the very first or from the beginning, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, I think it's important to note here that Luke didn't see these things. He heard them. I think it's important to note that he knows them to be true, and he knows them because they were things fulfilled. That means they are fulfilling something, which means they are fulfilling the prophecies. So every time we look at the book of the, go the Gospels, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they're very similar, we are looking at the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. So when you're thinking, you know, I'll just focus on the Gospels, I don't really need that Old Testament, think again. We only get Christmas, or the celebration of the birth of Christ, because of the Old Testament. And if you don't know your Old Testament, you're missing some stuff. <coughs> and, and so, but, so Luke really wants Theophilus to know, to be sure, to be certain that he hasn't believed lies. He wants him to know. You know, we read the, we listen to the news and we read the news so we can be informed. So we know what's really going on. This is the same thing. Luke's like, I want you to really know what's going on. That you don't believe, as another gospel, as another writer said, cunningly devised fables. And you may be certain in what you were taught. And he begins basically in the beginning with the birth of Christ. He, he actually begins a little bit earlier because he says the story actually begins with the birth of John the Baptist. It's paving the way. You know, when God comes into your life, he doesn't just show up, boom. There's other people who come into your life who show you a little bit of Jesus, who show you a little bit of God. And he, they pave the way for the revelation of Jesus Christ in your life. They get you ready. You might say they till the soil. And I, and I think it's, it's pretty awesome. But sometimes God is doing things in our lives and he's preparing us. He's sending people. He's sending events. He's sending circumstances. And we've, he's already been preparing us. I mean, if you look at the, the chapter, first chapter, and it's talking about Zechariah, and I encourage you to read it. I'm not going to read all of it. But if you look at Zechariah and his wife, it says that they, in, in chapter 1, verse 6, that they're both righteous, walking in all of the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Blameless, but they have no child. You might be doing, and God bless you if you are. I never can claim this. But you may be doing everything that God requires of you, and you may be suffering. 
You might be studying as hard as you can and you're just not getting the A. You might be working as hard as you can, talking to the right people, but you can't get the promotion or your business just isn't growing the way you want it to grow. You might have done everything that you know humanly possible to do, and believe it or not, you could find yourself homeless. It's not necessarily your fault. Sometimes we don't know that. But these things happen. That's why we, gotta, we have to be humble before we judge people. When we see the man on the street who's an alcoholic, he may not have, that might not have brought him to being on the street. He might have drank the alcohol so he could stay warm that night. We have to be careful because we don't know what brought people to the circumstance that they're in. And in this case, in, in this time and age, if you were childless, despite all the Old Testament stories of Sarah and Abraham, okay, Isaac, Rebecca, despite all of those stories of women who were barren and it wasn't their fault, it was still considered the curse of God if you could not have children. So here, that's why the text is so specific. It's just that they were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and blameless. I still want God to say, when I stand before the throne of God, I want him to say, yeah, I'm blameless. But you know what's super cool? He says that because Jesus Christ died for my sins so I can go before the throne of grace, blameless. And it says they had no child. Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So they were past the age of retirement, and then some. And it says, so while he was serving as priest before God, an angel came before him. You're serving God, and you're, you're looking for some answers. You've been reading the scriptures. You've been praying, spending that time with Christ. You, you've been doing everything, but your hope has died, and you become numb. And I think that's what happens to Zechariah. He, he becomes skeptical. He sees the wicked prospering, and yet he's doing the best he can, and he and his wife are getting old, and there will be no one to care for them. He wonders, but he still serves the Lord. And it says the angel, and it says an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. This is important. On the right side is the good side. It's the power position. It's the you have favor with God. When the angel is on the right side, God is saying good. Yes. The positive. Zechariah should have known this. And when Zechariah saw, he was troubled and fear fell on him. Now, if the angel had been on the left side, he probably would have died almost immediately because that would have been negative. Okay. A little history. When Moses used to go before the most holy, and you know there's the angels that are above the Ark of the Covenant, one on the right and one on the left. And if they were asking for God's judgment, a light, one of the angels, on, if it was a yes, the angel on the right would light. If it was a no of judgment, the angel on the left would brighten up. Okay? So, but Zechariah has to know all of this, but nonetheless, he is troubled and he's afraid. The afraid is normal. Everybody in the Bible, whenever they see angels, freaks out. Okay, so that part is normal. Okay. And the angel says to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he'll be great in the sight of the Lord, 
and, and some specifics. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Just a point of note, it says that he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. This is a long conversation. I want you to know we only got part of this conversation. Because Zechariah took so long, the people thought he died in there. Okay, this says that later in, on in the chapter. But Luke gives us the most important details, just like every good journalistic story has the points in the beginning. And he says, um, he'll not drink wine or strong drink. Have you ever noticed that wine or strong drink are called spirits? You'll get filled with something, but it won't be the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that's important to remember in the holiday season. Not all eggnog is eggnog you should drink. Okay? But he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. You know, I learned to read by the time I was three. And my mom tells me she used to read the Bible to me when I was in the womb. And they say you're not supposed to push your children, but she'd already kind of laid the groundwork, you know. And it says... Um, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But Zacharias, this is a wonderful message. I don't understand why Zacharias is like, oh. Hallelujah, this is what I've been ministering to. This is, these are the prayers of Israel being answered. God is going to make the people ready. But he doesn't say that. He says, how shall I know this? How do I know you're telling me the truth? He's skeptical. And he says, for I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and, ha and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. What is your problem? <laughs> like, seriously. And, and he says, but notice the question, how shall I know this? And then Gabriel, actually, the dude who showed up and, and Zacharias was afraid of just from looking at him, has to explain himself. The angel who stands next to the throne of God has to explain who he is. Now, come on, this, this joke, this dude walks among the coals of fire of the throne of God, okay? His name means mighty and strong man. And he got to justify himself to the priest who's supposed to recognize him in a moment? I wondered about this. And this is why Gabriel doesn't finish. He says, but behold, you'll be mute and not able to speak until the, until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Sometimes God has given us word. Some of you have got messages from God and you're waiting for their fulfillment. And you're tempted to say, how do I know it's true? Don't, don't ask that question. Because you might be really messed up until it happens. This guy couldn't talk for nine months. OK? He can't praise the Lord and give thanks because he saw an angel. And not just any angel. He saw, like, number one angel. OK? He can't say anything. Silence. Horrible. And, and verse 21 says, the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long. That's why I said he was in there a long time. But I want to compare and contrast this learned man because I feel like sometimes those of us who know so much are the most skeptical. And I, I think about that sometimes it, it, maybe it comes with age. I don't know. When you're young, your parents say, we're going to get you this. You're just excited. You just you ask them every day, when are you going to give me my bike? When's Christmas coming? When's this? When's this? You know it's coming. You just can't wait. But there's no question in your mind that they're going to do it for you. But suddenly we get older, and I guess we have disappointments in life. And, 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 like, and we apply, you know, 
the disappointments that we learned from our parents or friends or other people we trusted because maybe we never did get that toy they promised. Maybe they couldn't do what they said they were going to do. And we start to doubt. And we, we want evidence, not just that it's going to happen, but the person telling us has the ability to do what they say they're going to do. And then we apply that to God. This is where Zachariah is at. But if you, you go later down in the chapter, we find out that Gabriel is sent by God to someone else. To a virgin betrothed to a man, this is verse 27, whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw, she was troubled. Notice it at his saying. Now imagine you're somewhere between the age of, I don't know, 14 and 21. You've never been married. You're about to be married to a slightly older man who's already been married. You don't have any money. Nobody pays any attention to you, and you're poor, so people treat you badly all the time. The Romans come into your home, and they take your stuff. The wealthy people tell you you're not worthy, and you're a young woman. People don't even want to teach you how to read the law. They don't want to teach you how to read. And so she's not feeling very favored. Mary sounds an awful lot like the name Mara, which means bitterness. But this angel comes in and tells her she's favored. And she's troubled at his saying and considers what manner of greeting this was. I'm not feeling very favored. This is weird. And the angel says to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. He basically just said, yo, Mary, you about to be king, queen of the universe. Check it out. Like, you are about to be, we don't like to say this in Adventism, but you're about to be the mother of God in the flesh. That's a trip. So Mary's like, now look at her question. She says to the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? Now pause. Let's go back to Zachariah's question. He says in verse 18, how shall I know this? She says, how can this be? He's like, how do I know it's true? She says, assuming everything you say is true. I mean, dude, you're an angel in my house. How is this going to happen? What, by what process does this occur? And I love this because the angel says, and she continues, since I don't know a man. She only knows one process for babies to come into existence. Okay? She's only ever heard of that. But you know the text says that God's thoughts are above our thoughts. Right? Right? And his plans are, what are they, greater than our plans? Right? Higher than our plans. That's right. Hmm. And his thoughts towards us are, wait, more than can be numbered? Or am I mixing verses? I'm sick. And, and he says, and, but, but Mary's like, okay, I only know one process. So how are you going to make this happen? That's a legitimate question. If God walks into your house and he says, you, by this time next year, we'll win. You will, I will give you a million dollars. You're going to be like, yeah, right. But don't do that. Stop yourself. Say, this is God. <coughs> I accept that. But seeing as how my unemployment just ran out, they don't believe that I'm disabled anymore. And um, I used all my savings. My rent is two months due. I'm about to be evicted, and my car just quit and needs to go into the shop. 
I'd just like to know. By what process <laughs> am I going to be rich next year? Now, <coughs> now, I want you to think back. Abraham, God tells him more than once, you're going to have a son. Abraham laughs. Now, I've often wondered because they say that Abraham believed God but he laughed. I think the laughter was, by what process? That's crazy. But you're God. I believe in you. I know you can do all things. You brought me from my father's land into a land that I never knew. You have guided me, my wife, my family. I have grown wealthy as a foreigner amongst aliens and strangers. You have protected me. I know you can do all things. He says, but this is funny. But he believed God. He didn't understand it. Hence our whole Hagar situation. They don't know how it's going to come to pass. But they believe in a God, even if nothing else makes sense. And the angel talks about this. He says, the angel, I love this because the angel explains to Mary in detail. Now, the, Gabriel actually explains to Zechariah, but not very much in detail. But here, the angel in verse 35 says, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed. Now, pause there. He went into detail. He says, I, you're not, it'll make no, this is not going to make sense to you. But I'm going to tell you anyways, the, at least enough for you to get it. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. Some of us wonder how we are ever going to attain to a character that reflects Christ. We look in the mirror every day. We, we listen to our own thoughts, and we ponder this question. I know myself. I say, Jesus, I love people, but you know what? I don't really like them that much. It made me crazy. And I said, but I want to love them like you love me. But I don't. How is that going to happen? How am I going to have that love? How am I going to be the testimony of Jesus Christ? And his testimony is that he loved us. Well, guess what? It's the same thing that Gabriel tells Mary. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And that holy thing you being reborn again, that's going to be Jesus Christ in you. The Holy Spirit. And we say, but, and he knows that we're having a hard time getting it because that seems so like, I don't even get that. Like, how does that happen? And he gives us a little piece of evidence. And, and so he says, but usually the evidence is a person, which is kind of trippy. And he says, now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age and is now in the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be or is impossible. And Mary said, love this. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. You just, it doesn't have to make sense. You only have to believe in the God that was really born. And when you have questions and you have doubts, especially at Christmas, some of us wonder when we're like, Jesus wasn't born during Christmas. Well, who cares? <laughs> he was born. Amen. You know what? And this is the one time the world actually talks about him, and it's okay. You can actually go to work now and go, bless you, Jesus loves you, Merry Christmas. You've been holding it in all year. You know, I mean, this is awesome. You can come up, go up to a Wiccan now and be like, Merry Christmas, Jesus loves you. This is good stuff. And they'll be like, thank you. This is good. I say that, but Whenever you remember that Jesus is born, remember that that is a historical fact. 
Nobody denies that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, walked on the earth, lived and breathed and died, and was in fact crucified. You can hang your hat on that. You can believe that every day. If you believe that is true, you can believe this entire scripture. You don't have to understand all of it. But you know that there is a God who loved you because he sent his son and changed time. That the Jews still exist, so you know there's a God. They're the best evidence that there is a God from old to new times. Those facts alone should give you faith. But just because God doesn't, he doesn't want you to be uncertain. He doesn't want you to be unsure. And there's one thing I really do appreciate the fact about Christmas. Did you know that Christmas is set for the darkest night of the year? When it was the darkest in human history, Jesus Christ was born. And you say, how do you know, Tammy? Isn't it now? It's a little different now, but we're getting there. In that time, they used to throw the babies in the street with the sewage. Okay? At that time, if you sent your little boy to the gym, he might come back severely injured, and it was justified. Okay? We talk about people being confused about their gender and their sexuality and all of these things. This is just the natural result of sin. But if you go back to those times, people didn't even get to choose that. It was forced upon them. It was forced upon children. It's one thing to choose your life. It's another thing for an adult to take it from you. And we get angry now. But we have laws against those things. There were no laws. It was justified. It was so dark. There were no hospitals. If you went to jail, nobody fed you. You starved to death and died in there unless your family brought you food. It was very dark when you are considered an atheist for believing in one God because you don't believe in like a hundred. Okay? This is, this is, when, when the leaders of your church are chosen by the people who want you dead. The Jewish priests were chosen by the Romans at this time. This is the darkest time in Earth's history. When you walk outside your city gates and there's human beings whose flesh is being picked off by birds and dogs. Dark time. And sometimes we wonder, Jesus, where are you? And he says, I'm coming in your darkest hour. And Christmas should remind you that Jesus Christ is coming in your darkest hour. In the dark. I've often wondered, why does he, did he allow Christmas to like get all twisted up? And then I thought about it. He says, because winter is dark. People need something to have hope. Even people who don't believe in me need some hope every year. And I'll give them hope wherever I can and where they most need it. Suicides are at their greatest at this time of the year. People need the hope that you can give them, the love that you can give them, because Jesus Christ was born in you the moment you accepted him. You may not feel like it. It may not look like it. You might be like poor Mary. And at the worst time, when you're about to give birth, some mean Caesar makes you travel by donkey, and you're nine months pregnant, and nobody will give you a place to stay. And you have to give birth in a mud corral with animal feces. And you're giving birth to the king of the universe. It, this may be your life. But you, the king of the universe, is growing in you. And he says, I can reveal myself, my peace, my love, my joy. I can give you rejoicing in a mud hut, and in, in homeless, or in a big palace. I can give that to you, and I will give it to you. But you got to believe that. Think about all the choices Mary and Joseph had. 
Read the stories for yourself. And then think, how does this apply to my life? What if I don't believe what God said he's going to do? What if I just don't believe that I can be a blessing to others? What if Mary didn't believe she could be a blessing? What if Joseph didn't believe she could be a blessing? Wow, what would have happened? Believe that God dwells in your heart because you accept him. Especially at Christmas. You may be the light in somebody's darkest hour. When you worry about speaking a word of encouragement, don't worry, speak it anyways. If you feel the need to tell someone you know God loves you and you don't know if they're Christian, who cares? Tell them anyways. They might just need that to hold on in their darkest hour. Because remember, the kings come by with gold and frankincense. The shepherds come by later. Next thing you know, they got enough money to travel to Egypt. You never know what God might do. And we know he's coming again. When it gets even darker than it got during Roman times, and it will get darker, don't be surprised. Remember, Jesus Christ was born, and he's coming back in the clouds of glory with tens of ten thousands of angels to come and take us all home. Hold on. He's coming, and he's coming soon. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to lift up the trumpet and let it ring that you're coming again. You came and you walked here, footsteps among men and women, and you gave us hope, so much hope. We, we started hospitals and we took care of the poor and the orphans. Nobody did that before. Lord God, grow in our hearts. Let your Holy Spirit overshadow us that we too might be like Mary and say, how can this be? What By what process? Let us ask questions of faith. And let us say, like she said, hey, I'm your handmaiden. I'm your, say, your servant. Do with me as you please. Work in us, because we want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servants. Enter into my life. Thank you for the season. We can boldly talk about your blessings and your story. Thank you for even the food that we will eat to remind us of your blessings. Thank you, Jesus. We pray. Amen.